Ongava was set up as a rhino sanctuary in the early 90s and the real focus has been the reintroduction of white and black rhino to this particular piece of land um, bordering on this, bordering this, the southern border of Etosha National Park. Obviously in southern Africa we have two different species that we're looking at, that's the white rhino and the desert adapted black rhino, southern, southern black rhino. The white rhino on Ongava privately owned, they were introduced in 1993. We were able to acquire a small breeding population from Omphalozi. Um, the, these animals were introduced all the way from South Africa and over the years um, they have been uh, very successful in colonizing this area and there's a healthy uh, breeding population of white rhino um, on Ongava at, at the moment. As I mentioned earlier we uh, have done the paternal and maternal lines in our in our white rhino population and what that means is we're able to create little starter packs uh, for other game reserves in Namibia where we can take unrelated white rhino males and females and take them off the property, capture them and, and populate other, other farms or other game reserves in Namibia with, with white rhino starter packs. The black rhino in Namibia are all state owned, um, so the government um, maintains ownership of the meta population. They do this for, for a number of reasons, but what they have done is allowed um, communal and commercial game reserves around Namibia uh, a custodianship role in looking after these rhinos. So Ongava many years ago in 1999 applied to be a member of what the government called the custo Black Rhino Custodianship Program and we were approved as a, as a custodian which allowed us to get um, small numbers of black rhinos um, in those, those early years. They start off by giving you um, males um, so they gave us a small population of male black rhino. Over a course of a year or two we were assessed, we looked after those rhinos fairly well and then they gave us females, those were introduced um, in 2001 and 2005 and that black rhino population has grown into uh, a healthy breeding population of black rhino which forms a, an important population in the Namibian meta population of black rhino. We're viewing one of the water holes here on the game reserve. Stuart, uh, this is a one of the water holes is it it's a man-made water hole on or one of them on the game reserve where the animals come and drink yeah so all of the water points on Ongava are either manufactured by man for rainwater collection or um, man-made in that we have built a water hole and we pump it so um, there's no there's no natural water source that yeah. occurs on this piece of land um, so for example this one behind us has been it's got a there's within a couple hundred meters of here there's a a borehole which has been drilled and that's got a, a submersible pump in it with a solar yeah. system on the top which provides um, energy energy during the day which then pumps the water out of the hole and into a storage facility which then feeds the water hole. Mm -hmm. And then the other the other form of water water we put out is rainwater. So we, we dig dams um, and then once a year during the rainy season there are rivers on Ongava, well, Namibian rivers, which yeah. mean that they're dry, they don't have any water in them. Yes. But during the rainy season, these rivers flow and they then flow into these, these dams and fill up. And then that, these dams hold water for you know, a, num a number of months through the year. So they supplement the, the borehole water. Yeah. Do you at any point close off any of these water holes to manage the, uh, the movement of the animals? It, it, it does happen, so we don't do it very very often. But yes, you you can use it as a as a technique to move animals around. But you have to be very careful about the impact that um, the closing waters has um, when when looking at territories of you know, anything from lion to to black rhino, because yeah. uh, you know water points are social points. So if you shut down half the water holes in one part of yeah. a game reserve, any game reserve, it means all those animals which were drinking at different spots have to come to one point and that point it's like us at the pub so everybody comes into the pub for a, um, yeah. for, a for a chat or it can be a point of, of conflict so yeah. for a fight so we you have to take that into account as you open and close water points around a property yeah so the uh, some of some of the water holes i guess can have <clears throat> a little bit of trouble with the elephants like Maybe the tank get pushed over, pipes get uh, ripped out, but they, they're big animals, they drink a lot of water. They have a significant impact on, on water mm -hmm. sources in all sorts of ways. So, you know, having elephant on a property, the, the damage they do to the infrastructure, so the pumps, the stands, the water points themselves, that's one aspect you have to manage. So 
they, they've got an, an incredible ability or affinity mm -hmm. to find a leak in a pipe. So yeah. if you've got a buried pipe and there's just a small leak in that pipe, they will find it, they will dig it out, they'll pick that pipe out and then they'll pull your whole pipeline yeah. out. Um, so that's one aspect that, of elephants and water holes, which is a challenge. I mean, you, it's very difficult to stop a six ton or five ton animal deciding yeah. what it wants to do. The other thing is they, they often dominate a water point. Yeah. So other animals can't drink. Um, and um, in terms of domination, they also, you know, they're defecating in the water points as well and changing the taste of the water, which perhaps animals like or don't like. Yeah. In our experience in this area, they generally don't like yeah. it. Um, case in point is if you look at Atosha, when the rains come, uh, which is our neighbor to the north, the moment the rains come, the yeah. general game disperse from the water points because they they can drink fresh water in the felt and not from a water point, which has been... Um, yeah soiled by elephant but you will see i mean even around the water points around us all around here you'll see indications that elephant are are busy and yeah. behind us we can see there's some aponi tree yeah. that have been yeah. broken and damaged to the left of us and that's all elephant is that changing that's, the landscape. that's good that's good for for the reserve i don't know if you noticed what we've been driving around today but we went through a couple of acacia glades yeah and you know f for us seeing large acacia trees is is um it's a nice sight yeah but actually if you look at what's happening in that area where those acacia trees have been damaged or broken you're seeing a lot more growth at a at a lower level which yeah. is um, a food source for animals such as black rhino black faced impala kudu other other browsers are now able to utilize yeah. those acacia trees or acacia bushes now because they're no longer trees the elephants have broken them down whereas as a tree they're only really um, a food source for things like giraffe and elephant which can get to the upper branches yeah so it's it doesn't look very very neat but it's i think serving a, an important purpose for making food available for other animals yeah well that's that's interesting i've also had a question in the back of my mind you know that this this reserve was probably something before it became a conservation area um was there anything behind that or well i mean it's 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 been this actually it's the i mean it's a wonderful part of the success of ongava is that you know we, before ongava was formed in the early 90s they were cattle farms so yeah. we had um we had the, the property was made up of four old commercial yeah. farms and these farmers up here they farmed with beef to beef farms and goats and you know you're fighting everything as a as a farmer up here if you're trying to do um domestic livestock i mean you got to deal with the elephants who are destroying your water water installations you got to deal with the um the lions that are trying to eat your livestock um you got to deal with erratic rainfall yeah. i mean i haven't touched on that yet but you know namibia is a dry arid uh um, environment and i mean just like last year we had a terrible drought you know that can happen so you're yeah. fighting everything as a commercial farmer if you change the land use to wildlife Wildlife are much more robust yeah. um, to drought, um, you know, provided you get some rain and there's some growth, you know, the animals are utilizing not just grazing, but the bushes, browsers, the forbs and everything else that is growing. Um, you know, animals, are, um, wild animals are, are much more adapted to, um, um, to dealing with disease. So you don't have to dip kudus and oryx. Yeah. You know, they they yeah. have natural immunity to, to diseases that they'd face in, yeah. in, in the bush. So changing the land use from domestic um, domestic animals to game has um, has made the land more productive um, in terms of what it can carry in terms of wildlife and, and, and large stock units but the the social impact for for um, our, our humanity for want of another word in this in this um, region the Kuneni region has been massive I mean if you took each individual farm unit as as a as a as a farming unit before it was turned into a game reserve you would have maybe had the farmer and his wife and maybe some kids and or some children and maybe one or two farm laborers yeah. working for him so you'd have a, f a social footprint of maybe five or six people per unit um, so four farms old cattle farms six seven people per farm it's not very many yeah on Garva game reserve at the moment employs over 170 people in you know tourism research yeah uh, conservation security um, so it's a um, it's a has a much lower impact on the land yeah. and a much higher social impact in terms of uplifting communities in our area um, and positively af affecting the economy of Namibia 
Yeah, that's amazing. Seems like we got some rhinos coming to the water hole. We're, we're, rhino. we're quite lucky in our water at the moment in, in this part of the world. And that as you move south towards uh, Uchu, yeah. it gets quite a lot deeper. Um, but most of our our water is within um, within sort of 30 meters from the surface, yeah. which is which is boreholes go in, in depth and Namibia is quite shallow. So we've been quite lucky to have an abundance of water. Yeah. And this is good water. So yeah. Really nice and clean. Lots of lots of minerals. Yeah. So, but yeah, good quality. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. We actually at our at our at our main lodge we have a bottling plant there where we. Oh actually, really? Yeah. We we take water out of the borehole. It goes through a, a purification process, so it removes some of the um, some of the salts in the water because yeah. it's they're, they're, there's quite a lot, um, and then it goes into bottles, which we then serve to um, our guests who come and stay with us. Wow. So. You, basically, when you stay with us, you're drinking the water from underground as well. Yeah, wow. What a great thing. Good for the body. Yeah. Good for your teeth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see that we've got, I mean, you've got the concrete water hole, which yeah. is a, a little bit unsightly. Um, but there are animals that uh, prefer to drink clean water. And yeah. we always want to have a clean water source for animals. And then we have an overflow, which is for animals to wallow in yeah. and roll in. So an elephant, rhino. Um, mountain zebra, they love the mud as well, funny yeah. enough. So we, we have both on, on sort of offer for the animals so that they, they, can, exp they can pick and choose what they want. And you'll yeah. see that as a common theme throughout all the water yeah. points um, oh, on Ongava. You know, one, of the, one of the issues with having just a natural depression, having water in it, is that this area, um, and Atosha as well, you get um, uh, anthrax. Yeah. which occurs naturally in the oh, soil. Oh, really? Yes. So you, you, at certain times of the, of, of the year, or if you have a, an abnormal rain season, either too much or too little, this tends to bring out um, events um, mm. of anthrax, which develop in certain... It tends to develop in certain species. So we've been unfortunate to have it many years ago in our, in our white rhino. We, we, lost, we lost two white rhino to anthrax yeah. previously, but since then we vaccinate on an annual basis. Yeah. Um, to make sure that um, the animals are not susceptible to anthrax, but you also get it in the wildebeest and the oryx. Yeah. Um, it, it seem, and it just seems to come about every yeah. few years. But that's natural anthrax. Completely, in the, it completely in the natural occurs in the environment. So yeah. what happens is an animal will die of anthrax. Yeah. The little anthrax bacteria is, is quite hardy. It, it uh, sporulates, so it forms yeah. a hard, basically, shell around itself. Um, and then this carcass, as it um, degenerates into the earth, um, that little bacteria can sit in that that state for quite a number of years and then should the right conditions come along yeah. it can then become active um, so quite an interesting uh, yeah um, sort of disease that we have that's sort of in this area naturally yeah but it doesn't ever control the populations naturally we haven't it? we haven't had an outbreak that has caused severe numbers or, or or severe um, loss of a particular species. Yeah. We have had that in this area with rabies. Yeah. So rabies you do get. I mean, the vectors that are common in our area are jackal yeah. um, and uh, the kudu antelope. Yeah. They are particularly susceptible to rabies um, because of the way they feed in their social structure. Yeah. And so we have in, in the past, as a result of, of jackals being rabid and then passing that on to kudu, we have had losses yeah. Um, of kudu to rabies um, in in Ongava. It's, I mean, you know, it's common throughout Namibia. Yeah, yeah. So. No, that's true. That's exciting, guys. We got some uh, three white rhinos coming to the water hole. We're just going to tone down our voices, but I'm sure they can hear us. It's quite amazing as well when they when they start drinking, you know, they sip the water rather than, you know, chunking it up or and uh, being such a big animal, must drink a lot of water, but uh, doing it so silently, we'll keep an, uh, an ear out to hear if we can hear any noise from, uh, from the water being sipped up. And of course, they are a bit cautious. Um, we are being patient because these animals are a little bit uh, wary about us being here. They are relaxed. They're just checking us out. And then if they get the... Um, they get comfortable enough, they'll come in and drink, probably all three of them. They must take about 60 liters or something. Yes, yeah, so adult white rhino is 70 liters. Yeah. 70 liters. A day, yeah. I mean, that's the estimate. Yeah, 
I think as they're walking in there, they're keeping their ears on us. I think they're just uh, trying to judge how far how far we are from them. And again, one of them just kind of stopped short because it might have gotten a scent. Yeah, but you can see since the first one has come to water, yeah, the two have come oh, in yeah, much quicker. It's like yeah. more, a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, somebody else has taken the first, the, yeah. the big step. You also see a lot of times the tail, when they're relaxed, it's it's hanging yeah. quite um, nice and loose. But when they're disturbed or a little bit uh, anxious, it curls up. And that tells you that they're a little bit uh, nervous. There's also quite a lot of vocalization that goes yeah. on between white rhino. Most people don't know about it. But if you if you actually listen to them as they chase around after each other, the little ones, the calves are looking for their mums. There's a whole bunch of vocalization that goes on between white rhino. Um, it's quite an interesting thing that uh, yeah. I think people are starting to look at now. Because you know, they're kind of thought of as a fairly silent animal in terms yeah. of they're not like a lion or an elephant who, who make large recognizable sounds. But there's definitely a lot of vocalization that goes on with them. Yeah. And this is sort of kind of typical your little buddy group, so. Yeah. Couple of friends together, all youngsters, all between yeah. the ages of sort of three and a half and five and a half. Regardless of male or female, yeah. At, at that age, it doesn't matter. No. Yeah. They're just looking for friends. Yeah. They really don't like being on their own. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know, we were talking just earlier about the mm -hmm. sort of males having quite or thicker horns and females having yeah. thin horns. You can, if you look at the first two animals, you can already see that. So, the middle one is a, I think, a, a male. Yeah. And, and you can see the base is a bit thicker. Yeah, I mean, it, it yeah. seems smaller, but it's the base so of the its horns are thicker than is, the first yeah, one. Yeah, it's younger, but... Uh, yeah, you really can see that. Yeah. Anything else coming? No. I don't think so. I don't know where those others are, but on the other side. You often see the youngsters come in a little bit earlier. Yeah. They're not quite sure what they're supposed to be doing with their whole day, so they normally come to the pub a little bit earlier than the, the older animals, yeah. a little bit more secure in, in what they do on a daily basis. So you often see young young black rhino, young white rhino come in early. They have a drink and then they sort of hang around and wait for other, other rhinos to arrive yeah. and, then, and then interact. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it seems like as the sun is going down, there's a, there's a cool breeze coming in. So the movement of air, the smells are moving around. So they, they tend to get that uh, waft of air and then start snorting. And Did you see how the one at the back moved though? You know, so they, they go into these sort of defensive positions where their, their, their bottoms go together yeah. and their heads yes, stick yes. out. Like, uh, like soldiers. Yeah, everyone looking yeah. in a different area. So what you don't don't often see in white rhino is a tail missing or an ear missing, mm -hmm. but in black rhino you often have little or adult black rhinos who are missing an ear or missing a tail or missing both ears or both yeah. ears and a tail. And what happens is is when um, when the black rhino cows are very small calves, they hide their calves, yeah. so they don't take them with them to water. So they leave them quite far, a couple of kilometers away from the water hole, hidden in some thick bush. The adult female goes to the water drinks and it, it then returns to yeah. the calf but in that period where the calf is alone sometimes they get they get discovered by a hyena and the skin's were quite thick on a little rhino even a, a small sort of couple of month old rhino and so the only thing that the hyenas can get hold of is the ears, ears or yes. the tail so they they can pull off the ears pull off the tail i've yeah. got one little black rhino who's got a bit bigger now but um he's lost both his ears He's still got his tail, but he's lost both his ears wow. to hyena, so he's earless. <laughs> sure. And it's, and it's quite yeah. quite entertaining because they seem to remember that. They, black rhino don't like predators at, at all. all yeah. Whereas white rhino tend to tolerate them. They walk yeah. past them. They, yeah. don't, they, don't, they don't, seem, don't seem to feel threatened by, by lion or hyena. So often you'll have lion lying at a water hole at night and rhino will come in. The white rhino will walk past, have a sniff, then go for a drink and then leave. Yeah. Black rhino, they'll come in, they'll see the lion. The first thing they do is 
charge at the yeah. line or the hyena, chase them away, and then they'll come and have a yeah. drink. They just don't like predators. <laughs> yeah, it seems like you have one with uh, black shoes on. A couple of <laughs> yeah, it's amazing that, you know, we're sitting out here viewing these magnificent animals and um, I'm just thinking, you know, uh, if we keep the conservation going, you know, my children and their children's children would be able to see or have a, a sighting like this uh, as we're having. So this is incredible and it's, it's great that the game reserve, uh, what it's doing to, to keep that uh, and protect these animals for future generations. Um, that's, that's, that's incredible what you guys are doing here. Thanks, Franco. Let's hope that it um, continues. Let's hope we're successful. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't want to steer away from the cool, yeah. uh, the cool mud. It seems we can off to enjoy another wonderful night uh, grazing. But that was exciting. Yeah, it was it's an amazing, great, eh? amazing experience. It was super relaxed. Yeah. I think one of them does not want to leave. I think that cool mud is such an amazing effect on it. What a wonderful day this was, a great ending, and uh, thanks, Stuart, for joining us. And thanks, Van Kurt, it was great. Huh? It was Fantastic. super relaxed, nice to see them. Awesome.